a, a wonderful opportunity this summer to um, spend an evening with the STEP program. And um, in doing the, the it, and, and the, the purpose of that night was to bring a lot of faculty together who would share with students something about themselves. And so, um, you know, the gift that keeps giving, if you volunteer to do something, you'll be asked to be doing it again. So um, these panelists were fabulous um, in that group, and I thought it would be really nice to bring them together to talk with you a little bit about their experiences sharing their stories with students and kind of how it works and how it doesn't work and what their advice might be for you and thinking about you know how to approach students with your story because of course your story is not your student story they're they're different stories and so we have um, Marcella Cuya uh, who is an assistant professor in the School of Education if you don't know her Russ Hovey who is a professor in animal science and Jesus Velasquez who is an assistant professor in chemistry Thank you so much for being with us. Okay, so this is all unscripted. Um, first of all, nice to see everybody. My name is Ross Hovey. I'm a professor in animal science. I've been at UC Davis for approximately 11 years. Uh, and in the United States for about 21. Uh, originally from Australia, if you didn't pick up on the accent, although I realize that's waning over, okay. over the years. Uh, and I'm the instructor for our introductory animal science class at UC Davis, which currently has enrolled in about 420 students. Um, our major, I noticed, was high on the list uh, for having a high representation of first-generation students. Uh, and currently, we have about 1,500 students in our major in animal science. Uh, most of our students are coming to Davis because, and coming to our major because they're aspiring to be veterinarians. Uh, if you're not familiar with the statistics, it's harder to get into vet school than it is to get into medical school. So these students are the top of <coughs> the rankings in terms of when they come to the Davis in the first place. They're also about 95% female. And so, as a result, here on the first day of lecture, there's this one outspoken, loudmouth male standing up in front of a primarily female audience, many of them first generation, many of them very unsure about their lives, their futures, and why they're. Uh, even here at Davis in terms of how what's going to happen next. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, they're under, under my wing, so to speak. And it, I find that a, a particularly humbling experience every year because, among other things, um, I was first generation going to university back in Australia. Uh, I often relate to them the fact that I wanted to be a vet as well. And when I uh, was at high school, I had very good fortune to be involved in a 4-H type program. Uh, my folks were from the city, and all of a sudden, I suddenly literally came home one day and told my mom I bought a cow. Uh, <laughs> and I can still see her jaw dropping to the floor. Um, anyhow, suffice to say, from that experience um, and that exposure, I decided that I wanted to be a vet. I had no certainty as to how that was going to unfold or what that path would look like. I was a good student academically, like all of our students, and so it was a case of, okay, well, I guess I need to go off to vet school. And in Australia at the time, it was a case of, you literally went from high school to vet school. You did a, an SAT type test. If you got a high enough score, you'd get in. And so I had all sorts of assurances that I was going to get into vet school, and I didn't. And so I often, at the first, lecture, I share that back to the students because one of the things that we will experience with our students is that only about 10% of our students will get into vet school. And so starting from day one, trying to engage them and to have them consider the possibilities and the options. And among other things, I bring that full circle and say, so that led me to go off to university and do an agricultural science degree. Uh, and I then turn around and say, and I'm glad that it worked out that way. And I think oftentimes there's so much pressure on these students to arrive on campus. Um, we just did some work with Sue Inkler in our dean's office. We're surveying our students during the quarter in terms of their, their <coughs> mindset as they go through uh, my class as freshmen. And one of the biggest things that stood out, I knew that was there, but we have the data now to show it, is the pressures that are on their students' shoulders in terms of expectations from others for them to succeed. Um, and so when you now multiply that out about these students being some of the, 
most academically gifted and there's um, such a large proportion of them were aspiring to go to vet school. Like the pressures are huge. So as I said, I turned that around um, and pretty much sort of start recounting. Okay, well then it was, I was left with the question of what else am I gonna do with my life and start explaining how I went off to university doing agricultural science degree, not having any idea what I was getting into. Uh, and in fact, interestingly enough, at this point in the quarter, um, we just had our first midterm and good news is most students did pretty well, but not all of them did. Uh, and recounting to them the fact that I pretty much bombed my first semester at university as well. Um, the good news is that things got better after that, um, but without having anybody to turn to, it was, it was literally a lot of self-reflection that uh, forced me to look back and or internalize uh, my, my navigation process and decide how I was gonna get myself out of this mess because maybe it wasn't an option, so. Uh, trying to share with students that sort of thing and uh, strategies to overcome that. Um, and we're also still trying to learn about what some of the pressures that students face are as we go. So um, anything I can do to bring the barriers down I, is something I, I try hard to do. I bring my dog to the first lecture. Animal science professor, I get to do that. Um, I call myself Dr. Ozzy. Uh, one of the things I find even, I think, is intimidating for a lot of our students is just having to call us professor such and such. And I have a hard time calling myself Professor Hobie. Uh, so I sort of coined the term Dr. Ozzy. Um, and I find that that also helps to uh, engage some students that otherwise might not feel comfortable <laughs> to approach me and so on. So yeah, anything I can do to try and break down those barriers and, and have them engage. Uh, still learning what that takes, but happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, so I relate to the story as well. I mean, um, I've only been here, um, so my name is Jesus Velasquez. Uh, Assistant Professor in the Department of Chemistry, been here for 2.5 years. Uh, and I can relate to that story. Uh, I teach general chemistry, so that it, it's, a, it's a pretty large class, usually up to the 400, uh, uh, in terms of amount of students. And one of the things that I've seen in the past uh, two years, a big difference, uh, was when I, when I present Great cutoffs, for instance, for midterm number one. This is what I did different last year than the first year. When I presented cutoffs, uh, I was a little concerned, right, because of, of the students uh, who did a little bit poor and such, in terms of the morale, right. Um, so I spoke to uh, my, my um, one of my mentors. Uh, his name is Professor Enderly, and he told me when you share the great cutoffs, you know, you get a care of it and everything. That's fine, uh, but when you do that, try to be uh, afterwards, try to be inspirational. So I said to him, well, the only way I know how to be inspirational is being personal. So I might just take the opportunity at this precise moment to actually share a little bit of what, uh, of what it is to deal with adversity, right? So we've all, we've all gone through taking the first few couple of exams and, uh, and bombing and then, and then figure out ways on how to uh, take, you know, turn that negative to positive. So let me tell you, maybe I only have two data points, okay, all right? So, don't, I mean, it might get better or not. Uh, I'll try it again next year and I'll, and I'll keep everyone posted. But I still, I definitely saw a change in morale. Uh, when I basically opened up uh, and I was, I just took 10 to 15 minutes to be a little bit vulnerable, uh, vulnerable share my story and how I, I dealt with adversity. Uh, and, um, and, you know, not only I got like this little standing ovation from students in terms of applauding. A lot of them came afterwards and told me, oh, thank you for sharing that story. I really needed to, to hear that at this precise moment. Office hours, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, we've, there was obviously the focus on, on the fundamentals and everything, but there was also students having the, uh, students afterwards had the courage now to come forward, right, and basically say, listen, I get it, there's all these wonderful resources in UC Davis, but I really don't know where to start. And it seems like you uh, have gone through these experiences, maybe we should have a five, 10 minute conversation on how to navigate, how to, how to navigate this together, right? Uh, so that's one way on how you know, my first generation story sort of uh, uh, has been useful uh, in the teaching part. But I also have the great fortune of having my own research group. And, uh, and that means that I have you know, eight to 10 students at the moment. Uh, they all come from different backgrounds. Some of them are first generation. 
And there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. And, you know, as everyone could uh, relate in this room, research is not, you know, peaches and cream 100% of the time, right? There is a lot of moments where there is a lot of adversity. Uh, and I tend to, you know, one of the biggest suggestions that I, or my mantra that I always bring to my students is, you know, let's focus on the things that you do have, right? Uh, let's focus on some of the successes and, and we, will figure that, we will figure this out as we go. So it, it, as you can see, it's, I mean, I'm pretty sure you all know this. It's just positive attitude, but then I think it takes a little bit of courage of putting yourself out there, right? Uh, uh, and once you, once you, you know, take that first step and just basically share your story, uh, it, it, it opens up all these channels of communication, right? Um, maybe you're just saying, well, you're young and naive. Come talk to me in, you know, 10, 15, please, uh, 10 or 15 years of, uh, 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 and then you, you tell me whether or not, you know, have you have enough data uh, to prove whether or not that this could be successful. But this, this has been my experience. One-on-one -on -one attention with my research group, uh, opportunities to be motivational and inspirational when failure is kicking in. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a risk worth taking, essentially. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marcella Cuellar, and I am in the School of Education. And one of my areas of, of research is really issues of access and equity in higher ed. So um, these topics are very ripe um, in, in my own research interests. And one of the strands is um, looking at Latinx student experiences and outcomes uh, at Hispanic serving institutions. And so one of the undergrad classes, I'll mainly speak about that class that I teach, is an issues in higher education course. And so one of the things that I make it a clear point to tell students from the very first lecture is that my own interest in this area of research is a reflection of my own experience. That my own trajectory as a first generation um, daughter of Mexican immigrants, um, youngest of six, and being the first and only to go on to a four-year institution and actually get a degree and now have a PhD, um, that that was all the impetus for my subsequent um, educational and professional trajectory. And so I'm very open about sharing that and also letting them know that the issues that we discuss in the class are some of the very challenging issues that existed 20 years ago, 20 plus some years ago, when I was an undergraduate sitting in their seat. And so that they know that these issues are very, um, um, not just personal, uh, but also that these continue to be the challenges that we face in higher education so that when we're dealing with some tough issues, whether it be finances, whether it be um, issues of admissions when, when uh, those issues come up, or campus racial climate, for instance, that the kinds of experiences or challenges that they might be facing as first generation students and that we're reading about have been issues that we've been grappling with for many, many years. And so that they hopefully can see um, an affirmation that these are not um, things that they cannot overcome and that it's not an issue that, that only they're dealing with, but that they're, they, um, they can also add their voice to this conversation. And so that's another thing that I do in my classroom because we are dealing with some issues that they're dealing with at this very moment that we're studying and continue to be challenges. Um, I do provide a lot of opportunity within my classes for students to speak and share their own experiences. And it's been really interesting to see how much students are have that desire to share and to integrate their perspective um, on, on these issues. And so I definitely readily um, provide that opportunity. I also let them know that some of the ways that I structure some of the class assignments has to do even with my own challenges. So for instance, I readily share with them that I struggled with writing as an undergraduate. And that even though I thought I was one of the best writers, because I was one of the best writers at my high school, but I also went to a high school that was um, under-resourced. And I didn't know that necessarily when I went to college. And so sitting <coughs> in, in a classroom where students were coming with a much um, stronger preparation, I, I was quickly already behind. And so I share with them that one of the things that I had to do was go often to get writing support. And so one of the things that I offer as part of my assignments is that if they go get writing support, we will, I will give them credit for that. And so students, um, some students very much take that up and, and, and I try to tell them writing is a process and who would have thought that 
well, as I was struggling as a writer, as an undergrad, that today now I would be writing all of the time for my career. And so I think it's important um, to kind of recognize those challenges that we face. One of the other things that is, I think is really important to, to share with them, and I share this very readily in class, is I didn't know I was gonna be a professor when I was an undergrad. That was not my trajectory. And so I think it's important to also affirm that um, they don't need to have their whole life planned out. I think that that's increasing the feeling and stress that students enter college with. And so I think even hearing that reality that there are multiple pathways to different um, trajectories and you may, the, the very career that they might even end up in may not even exist yet, right? And so I think it's important to remind students of that. And so I definitely share that with them. And I always conclude my very last lecture by reminding them of that. And um, reminding them that when I was sitting in their seat 20 years ago, I did not see myself standing in front of the classroom. And so I just share that with them to let them know that you might end up here someday and some of you should be up here someday. And so if this, be open to whatever opportunities are out there and seek the supports, um, I think that that's always, um, I always invite them. I look forward to the day where one of you is my colleagues. And so I think it's important to affirm that, that these are spaces that they can also um, um, aspire to and pursue in the future. I, I also want to mention that, um, especially in those one-on-one -on -one moments when students come to office hours, or with my own advisees, I make it, um, I really try to also be very transparent with the challenges that um, I encountered as a, as a, as a first-gen student that I might not readily share in the classroom. Um, but for instance, sometimes when there's tensions between our responsibilities at home, but also having responsibilities um, at, you know, with our studies. And so how do you make a choice? And so that those are, are, are constantly issues or tensions that we might be grappling with and that those don't necessarily end, right? Even once you become a professional, those tensions continue to um, play out in one's life. And so I think it's important to share that. I, I share students even with current challenges that I'm having that have to deal with the personal and, and, and the professional, but these of course are those relationships where um, um, there's more one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring. The other thing that I would also say is um, engaging students in research. So whether that is you know, um, um, serving as a, a research mentor in, through murals or through McNair and really engaging students so that they can really see themselves as researchers and engage in research that might be very engaging to them. So those are some of the things that I Add. Thank you. That was so great. Maybe we should just end there because it was so perfect. But uh, does anybody have questions or comments? Yeah. I have a question. How long has UC been tracking the proportion of first generation students and is it tracked on the application or the registration or both? Does anyone know? So it is tracked on the application um, and it definitely goes back at least until 2000 and I think before that. We've measured it differently over time, but um, so I think when I started here about five to six years ago, um, I think I don't remember it was it wasn't graduated for four year degree, so um, it used to be that you just finished high school and did yeah. but now it's that for like attended college that you can attend college, yeah. Um, now so far. So it's changed over time, but the numbers you see are we share a common definition over time. So So it's been about eighteen years. Questions? Yeah. Oh, oh, <coughs> hey, uh, could, 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 could comment about the uh, offshore assistance, the uh, couple of the panelists mentioned it. Um, lots of the uh, uh, students
they, 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 they sit, 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 sit there <laughs> reading our students to show up. <coughs> so if you can provide incentive to, 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 to actually have them come once, they'll go, oh, that really helped. I'll come back again. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, any, any more comment? So just uh, for my class, we've been doing some surveys along the way, and that actually came up in one of the recent questions, which was, did you attend office hours? Because I've been quite concerned that the students are not coming, um, surprisingly so, despite a lot of reasons why they should. Uh, and so one of the questions we asked is, did you attend office hours in, uh, in the first couple of weeks, and if so, how many times, knowing that actually there was very few students that even attended? But then those that did say yes, we asked them, would you recommend your friends attend office hours? And it was 100% you know, yes. Um, and so I plan to take that back to the class as a whole so that it's not me telling the students you should come to office hours, it's rather that their peers are saying, hey, you should try this sometime. I think that's sort of an effective way to you know, get students engaged. So I have the opposite question. How do you manage the line of office hours where you're like holding three to four a week and you can't get through the numbers and you have 25 students emailing you to join your research lab and you have no institutional support or graduate student to help you? I'm having like the opposite problem of like a lack of resources but too much student interest to manage as one person. So we should notice that Chris is from sociology, and sociology was the first major that showed up that's not both on the majority non-first gen, only on the majority first gen. So the resource, the reason why everyone's coming to you may be specific to your first gen student population. Comment. Well, I mean, I think that we are in this super, very advantageous opportunity that there is actually, well, at least from the science and uh, technology and math standpoint of view, there's all sorts of opportunities and resources to bring in. I think the first thing that we have to recognize is that there's a point where it's only, I mean, only, I'm only one person, and then immediately I have to take action and say, okay, what other what, what resources, what programs are out there that I can bring into the middle of the table as options? I mean, that's that's what I, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's actually what I do, and, and it works, uh, uh, it works pretty well because what you're doing is just developing, you're, you're orchestrating and tailoring uh, a team of resources per case. So you might be the person who is, who is responsible to say A, B, and C, let's team up and let's figure how we can help. That's how, how I see it. What does it look like? Well, for instance, um, one of the cases that I had uh, from one of my first generation students is that he was feeling you know, very stressed uh, um, with some of the failures happening in the laboratory to the point that he was considering of just leaving the PhD program completely. Uh, and actually he, you know, we've had multiple conversations where he even confessed a little bit of depression. Uh, so immediately I had to say, okay, well let me, let me contact my department and let's see what resources uh, are out there that we could uh, again uh, put a you know put a team together around him. So I, we contacted a, a, a human resources immediately. I mean, I put I, I, this was on Friday. Okay, I wrote this down. Uh, someone called me and say they might not address. They might not call him uh, until Monday. Little did I know, a one hour passed, and there was already a resources. There was already a person from human resources. Uh, talking to me, talking to the student, and now we have psychology folks, uh, um, people from uh, myself, and even uh, some of the administrative folks uh, who are colleagues in my department, all getting involved to provide the support that the student needs. So, I mean, it's, it's a team effort for sure, and we have the resources, we just have to look for them. 
I think the issue you're raising too, and I know there's several questions, I'm gonna keep it really brief. When we started this program and knowing that we were gonna put a directory out there and we were gonna tell students that they could come talk to you, one of the outcomes was going to be that too many students were going to come talk to some of you. And so that's something that I would like to know. I'd like you to contact me about it because what comes next, when, you know, what resources do we need to do to keep doing this work? I want to make sure I'm supporting all of you so that you're not getting overwhelmed with students. That's an amazing story of having a response and getting really support. And I know it doesn't always happen like that. So please do reach out to me. Don't just you know sort of shut her down the doors and just say I can't I can't handle this anymore. Let me try to work with your associate dean and department chair. Hi, my name is Valerie Garcia, which Professor Vasco is. I think we, you're coming in tomorrow to a UMP connection. I am. Yes. <laughs> um, so for those who know me, I'm Guardian Scholars Program Coordinator, which is a program for foster youth, which I'm so excited to see current and former uh, mentors of our program. Um, I'm also an EOP retention specialist. So one of the, um, I have a first year IV connection with our EOP students and you know, bring in faculty to talk um, about their experiences. That way they feel a little bit more comfortable um, with Guardian Scholars, I actually have an assignment, and some of you might have participated in this if a student was in your class, and it's really, really <coughs> helped develop a sense of, um, to remove that scary barrier um, of approaching faculty, um, which is um, an assignment they have to interview one of their professors, but it can't be anything about their class. It has to be about them. And that has really um, provided our students to know that they are, you know, that faculty, all of you are, you know, not these scary people that just know a lot about something, um, but they take pictures of their food and post it on Facebook as, as well, you know, um, or they send their kids to, or, you know, it's, they, they go to soccer games and, you know, all those things. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really helped them to be able to feel comfortable in a space where they can actually hear their, hear your story. And so this assignment I've done for several years, and it's been really, really helpful to have our students interact with our faculty in a way that's not intimidating, and it's a, it's a personal connection. So um, that is something that I felt like it's been really helpful for a lot of our students to continue having um, and taking a little bit more initiative to do that. So um, yeah, so. And by the way, if, I'm, if anyone's interested, <laughs> I'm also um, in, uh, inviting um, one or some faculty, one or two faculty, to come in on Monday from two ten to three. If anyone's interested to talk about how faculty are your are their friends as well. So if anyone's interested, let me know. One more question? Yeah. Hold on. Let me get you the mic. Um, I seem to be the odd man out here. Um, when I went to university, <clears throat> um, I got plenty of support, but it was also a very rigorous program, which I desperately wanted. And so my approach has so far been to um, throw people in the pool, in the deep end of the pool, by insisting on how we observe, how we think critically, and so on, and showing them the pleasures of doing this, and not necessarily making them feel comfortable and, and all that. I think they need to be feeling a little bit um, intimidated, quite frankly. And one of the issues that I'm wondering if anyone else has, has encountered, which I do and I find um, a combination of depressing and um, puzzling, and that is uh, when I introduced myself, I told my story and all that, and I told tons of ambition as a kid and all the rest of it, and then I asked them about their own and found astonishingly little ambition. Many of them had no idea why they were here. One woman told me that she was in biological sciences because the only thing she didn't hate. Um, what do you do about that? I have, I mean, this is where I might be first gen, but my experience, my academic experience is, is rather unlike what I've been hearing here today. And my approach has also been very unlike what I've been hearing here today. And I suppose a little diversity never hurt anybody, but I'm, I'm kind of puzzled by the whole thing. 
Thank you. I'm going to give that back to the panel. And what you just said, several other faculty said to me almost exactly that same thing after our last forum. So I really appreciate you bringing that issue up. Uh, I'll just quickly speak to the fact that I also struggle with this. Um, on one hand, you know, I'll put it bluntly, I went through the school of hard knocks to get exactly where I got to. And I'd do it all again, and I think I learned a heck of a lot in the process. Um, and had to fight tooth and nail to get everything that I ever um, accomplished. At the same time, I also see how responsive the students are when they are given that uh, extension of that velvet glove and students that are coming from different backgrounds and so on. So I think we have to wear both hats. And I think it almost becomes a case of we have to cater to audiences, a different audience, uh, depending on who they are and sort of trying to uh, acknowledge that in the process and then get them to the point where they do uh, face that challenge and grasp it and, and take it to the next level. It's, it's, a, it's a real tough challenge. At least I find it uh, a very difficult thing to try and navigate. Yeah, one more comment, please. I see you both nodding your heads. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that it is kind of finding that fine balance between both those things because I agree. Um, I always tell students, I have very high standards, so those I'm not going to lower. So oftentimes with writing assignments, students will say, well, can you give us a pro like an example of writing so that I, I can see what you're expecting? So what I've kind of landed on is I don't, I, t I explain to them why I don't give an example and it's because I want them to express their voice but to, to demonstrate their critical thinking in that process and, and I openly share that if, if I provide an example, my fear is that they're just going to use that because they're going to know what I'm looking for and, and I, after our first assignment, then I will share an example of what I think is, is an exemplary approach to writing, um, but provide them with different ones so that they can see there's not just one model because I think we do have um, oftentimes students who want to do very well because we have high achieving students here. And I think it's important to not forget that, but to still try to instill, um, for me it's always about trying to instill a, um, some critical thinking and to be uncomfortable in certain experiences and, and I think not knowing um, or not having a template is sometimes part of that discomfort that we need to expose them to. Let's thank our panelists.